Welcome. This is Watchman Privacy. I'm Gabriel Custodiot. If you like this listener-supported show and you want it to succeed and improve, please consider supporting it through one of the methods listed at watchmanprivacy.com. I have a privacy guide sold on Amazon, courses, and consulting. Free methods of supporting includes leaving positive reviews, subscribing to me wherever you can, Twitter, YouTube, Odyssey, etc., and sharing my work. Find links in the description or at watchmanprivacy.com. Your support determines the future of this show. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. I'm very pleased to be joined by two people from privacyguides.org. This is Nick DeVield and Jonah Aragon. Welcome to the show. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's my pleasure. And I'll just say from the beginning that Privacy Guides is one of these websites that's a fabulous resource for people searching for digital privacy tools in things like this show and my book, I obviously cannot always give you the most up-to-date week-by-week kind of thing. So this is where something like privacyguides.org comes in. Super valuable resource. If you just go there and you spend just a few hours reading that, you will be well on your way toward um, securing a lot of your privacy. Um, And just as kind of a base layer thing, before we start talking about digital privacy, I always recommend listeners, obviously, before you even have to select a privacy service, just practice what I preach, which is to have fewer accounts overall, do more things in person, don't do as much online, uh, just don't give out as much information as you can, use alias information. All the third parties that we're about to talk about are potential security and privacy vulnerabilities just kind of by uh, by definition. So just remember that as we go along. As we get started here, Jonah and Nick, I wonder if you could just give us a little bit about your credentials, your background. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm a system administrator by trade and uh, I have been working on the Privacy Guides website since uh, since 2019 now. Mainly just been doing uh, community management and reviewing all of the all of the great suggestions that our community provides to us. Um, just like John, my trade uh, basically comes down to system administration, and I'm also a Linux developer for our uh, our own company. Um, and further than that, I've been working on Privacy Guides since about 2020, I think. Excellent. Nice to have you both on. And we should note that part of privacyguides.org is a built-in forum and a matrix uh, channel as well. So there's all these people um, having conversations, having input, and Jonah and, and Nick are kind of the uh, the admins who who are selecting the the best resources and, and kind of uh, presenting them onto the the web website. Is that how it works, Jonah? Absolutely. Yeah, we're just, uh, we're two members of the team, but there's actually six of us total that work on this site. Um, and then we have a, a huge community of people who send suggestions and help us review everything. So that that mostly takes place on the form and matrix, like you said. Um, and then we also have some discussions on GitHub as well, which is where our site is developed. Right, excellent. So there's a there's an excellent kind of a group group wisdom that's working uh, towards this project. So um, that is, that's good to know. Um, and so let's start with this question, uh, which I guess is is kind of one of these questions of, instead of teaching, instead of somebody giving, giving someone fish, teaching them how to fish, how do you, and how should one of us evaluate a privacy service that we might be interested in? Well, one of the things we mostly focus on, you know, on is software that's end-to-end encrypted by default when it's applicable open source. We also like end-to-end encrypted services to always be audited because everyone uh, and their dad can scream that their service is end-to-end encrypted, but to have it actually be implemented well is a whole another beast. Yeah, th- those are all good characteristics that uh, that we certainly preach on this show. So when, when we're evaluating a, a privacy service software, I wonder how important is the company's stance on privacy? So if we use an example like a, a big VPN company, um, which I know you guys have some opinions on VPN that people can read on your website, but let's say that there's a VPN company that um, has a bit of a, maybe a shady past. Maybe they've been acquired by a company that has a little bit of a shady past, but but they're open source and they've been audited. And there've been court cases where there was proof of no logging. So the service itself is, is doing what we want it to do for a VPN. Uh, and maybe because it's so big, it's potentially cheaper uh, and more reliable. Uh, maybe there's more anonymity because you're in a larger user base. Um, what are your thoughts on balancing those kind of things, Jonah? Well, we have different criteria for different uh, things that we recommend. So VPN services in particular, we kind of take a harder stance on uh, like what we would 
generally suggest for most people. Um, trust definitely plays a big part in uh, VPN providers that we recommend because um, in reality with a VPN, what you're doing is shifting trust from uh, your internet service provider to that VPN provider. And if you can't trust them, um, then then there's really no point in it. Um, so that definitely plays a role in the VPN providers that we suggest more so than like it might for open source software that runs locally on your machine. If there's less trust required in the company, then we don't have to worry quite as much about that kind of thing. One of the big things that you guys promote, and I'm a big fan of, is Tor, the Tor, the Tor network. We have the Tor browser, and I just wonder what are what are some ways that people can make a make Tor a bigger part of their lives. For some people, it's it's really slow. It's a little bit inconvenient. Uh, they're only familiar with, let's say, the Tor browser. What are some ways that they can get to learn and love the Tor browser? Well, one of the ways they can approach Tor first is by downloading the Tor browser apps. I believe Tor browser, uh, the Tor browser is now also available for iOS since uh, since a short while, I think. Um, it gives you a nice, uh, nice, easy to install way to discover what Tor is all about and how it feels in your daily usage. Because I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for your normal usage, like normal browsing and watching videos, but in the case that you really want to have something private or if you want to search something up like medical information of some sorts um it gives you a, ni a nice little opportunity to just discover it and how you can how you can actually use it as a uh, as a valuable tool um i think it's the official orbot app that's available for ios now i don't think the browser itself has been ported yet um but maybe that'll be coming when ios releases there browser engine restrictions, which is hopefully coming soon. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about Orbot then. What What is that doing for us on, on our phones? Uh, Orbot's been, a, been around for a while. Um, it, it was on Android and it just recently released on iOS. It basically proxies all of the traffic on your phone over the Tor network, so not just your browser. Um, but it isn't quite as, um, it doesn't provide quite the same anonymity protections that the Tor browser does because Tor browser also has a lot of browsing specific protections like anti-fingerprinting and stuff like that. So um, it's not a perfect replacement, but it at least gets the Tor network accessible on iOS for now. Yeah, that's one of the things that yeah, most people should understand. Tor browser and Tor are two different things. Tor is something that can protect you on the network level, but on the application level, the a lot of other things can just well, happen. And what John was talking about, which is called browser fingerprinting, can still nail you down. Right. And so the Tor browser has some excellent uh, baked in fingerprinting protection. Uh, you can go to a website like deviceinfo.me on your regular browser and see what kind of information it can collect about you compared to the Tor browser. And you'll see a kind of a night and day difference. Let me ask you, you guys this question. So I, I'm kind of part of very skeptical communities and they like to go on about how uh, you know Tor is a is a government creation and and there might be backdoors, et cetera, et cetera. How do you handle, I guess, skepticism like that, but particularly directed at maybe Tor? How do you how do you guys uh, respond to those kind of people? Well, Tor in its basis is actually quite transparent, more so than a lot of other companies that, that you would see. That's uh, that's their whole well modus operandi. The, all their finances are transparent, all their code is transparent, all their research is transparent. So if anyone has a feeling that there is a backdoor or something, they can just read the code. They can read all the experiments that they did to see if there is any flaw. And we know actually that Tor is not some sort of privacy magic pixel dust. It's not a silver bullet. So things like civil attacks still, are, still exist, for example. But it is one of the best tools that we currently have. It's not perfect, but you should use it if it's uh, available to you. I mean, think of it like this. If the government is able to crack a valuable tool like Tor, would it be able to track a VPN service, which is just one hop from one single company, which is tied to your financial information, for example? 
Yeah, that's fair enough. Paul Rosenberg said in the past, he said, if, if these tools didn't work, there'd be a lot of people in jail right now. And so, by the way, listeners, uh, the way the way we're going about this is I'm just kind of picking uh, various topics from privacyguides.org for these two uh, gentlemen to talk about with their expertise. And I'm not going to put list of recommendations of the things we we discuss because it's all coming from the website. You should be going there and looking at what, what these two guys and, and the team at Privacy Guides has to say about them. So don't expect any links for particular services. Moving on from Tor, there are a lot of, I mean, a lot of people who are interested in privacy. We still like to visit websites like YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram. How should somebody who's privacy minded go about viewing these websites, participating in those services with the least exposure possible? Well, one of the ways that they can visit those sites is, for example, use the concept which is called front ends. For most major uh, social media platforms these days, there are some uh, some sort of open source front ends that you can visit, which are basically websites which act like a relay between you and the social media platform. The, the relay will make the search for you at the social media uh, website and then download the contents and then show it to you. Nidder, for example, is one that you can use for Twitter. And I believe there are also a few versions for YouTube. And I believe NVIDIA is also one. We recommend these front ends on our website um, because they can they can take this information from these platforms and display it to you without like any kind of in-browser tracking or any JavaScript required. Um, and that's probably the best way to go about it um, if you're if you're just consuming content, like if you're just watching videos on YouTube and TikTok, um, uh, doing it through these services can uh, provide you with some extra privacy. If you have to have an account on any of these services, if you're making posts yourself, for example, um, it's just best to follow the practice of giving them as little information as possible um, and just limiting as you said at the beginning of this episode, limiting the n- number of accounts that you create at all. Right. So there, you have all these what uh, Nick was and you guys call front end services, where you're still watching YouTube, you're still going on on Twitter and such, but you're doing it through a uh, through a proxy essentially. Continuing from tour, just talking about browsers generally. I was talking to somebody yesterday who said there's an increasing gap between the, one of the browsers that privacy people like, Firefox. And uh, Chromium or Chrome, Chrome-based browsers. Uh, that in that Chrome is increasingly just kind of widening the gap of performance. There are a lot of services that don't allow you to use Firefox or that are not optimized for Firefox. The one that we're recording on right now requires a Chrome-based browser. And so, uh, one of the sad things it seems is that there's not more good options for privacy browsers. Why are there not so many alternatives to browsers? Is it the sheer complexity of, of creating software like that? And where, where do we kind of stand with privacy browsers? I think it absolutely is um, a matter of complexity. The web browser is, after your operating system, one of the most complex uh, pieces of software that you're going to use and you use it on a daily basis. So like from a security perspective, it's just a nightmare to try and handle. And it takes entire teams and companies to make it's no longer something that anybody, any any developer, could just jump in and and do in in a couple of weeks. It's it's a massive undertaking, which is unfortunate for a lot of reasons. But it does mean we're kind of reliant on on Chromium. We recommend Brave Browser and Firefox at the moment on our site, um, and we specifically don't recommend a couple of uh, more popular privacy browsers um, that some viewers might be familiar with because we've noticed that with a lot of browsers specifically, um, any forks tend to lag behind with feature and security updates, which we we find that to be really problematic. Are we witnessing a decline of, of Firefox and, and Chrome just kind of taking over? Is that is that what you foresee in the next few years? That seems to be the trend that we're on right now. Um, and I'm not sure what to do about that really it's it's a tricky problem um to be honest with you i've been looking at what mozilla has been doing for a while and it feels like they're trying to diversify even their own business away from firefox a bit um and they're maybe not dedicating as much as they could be to 
Firefox development, which is a shame. It's it just it is what it is. Um, there's no clear solution to me, at least. Yeah, it is kind of hard. In one way, privacy guys just want to promote a monoculture in this way because monocultures are always awful for security. But on the other hand, if we know some people have very high threat models, are we right in then still recommending Firefox to them if Chromium still has clearly a superior security? Instead of answering that, let's let's encourage everybody listening. Look, if you want Firefox to exist, go let Mozilla know that you want it and you want them to focus their attention on it and decrease that gap and maybe consider contributing in some way. So I don't know, that's the only thing I can think of at the moment, but uh, uh, something that we don't think about uh, often enough that Firefox is not, it's not an inevitability and there's not a lot of alternatives out there. So just keep, keep that in mind. Another thing that you guys mentioned on your website, which I think a lot of people maybe don't think about enough is the importance of, or potential importance of using native applications over web services. So instead of using uh, internet service on your on your browser, you actually download the, the program, download the application. Why would using a native app potentially, potentially be more secure uh, and more private? How would that work? It kind of comes down to uh, this fundamental thing with how web apps work, where the code that they run is delivered to your browser by a remote server. And it's not checked at all in any way by your browser um, before it's run. It just trusts the code at the remote server kind of implicitly. So if you're using a web app specifically with end-to-end -end encryption, um, we can take ProtonMail just for an example, not that they would do this, but it's theoretically possible for you to go to the ProtonMail website and Proton sends you um, a modified version of the ProtonMail app that maybe backdoors your encryption somehow. Um, and they could choose to send it to only your account and it would be sent to your browser in a way that you basically couldn't detect that it's happening. It, there'd, be, there'd be no warnings or anything like that because that's just how JavaScript is delivered on the internet. Whereas with a native app, it would be trickier like once the code is shipped and it's running on your computer, it's pretty much going to stay that way until you update the app. And it would be trickier to specifically target a single person with a malicious app update than it, it, than it would be to uh, target a person with a malicious um, JavaScript modification, for example. So that's the main, the main reason that we trust web apps a little bit less than, than native apps, especially uh, in regards to end-to-end end -to -end encryption specifically. Would would that be an argument for accessing your Proton Mail mail from an iOS app as opposed to logging in on your browser? Yeah, um, if that's something that you're concerned about, um, I would definitely recommend using uh, either the native mo mobile apps or the Proton Bridge app with a uh, email client locally on your computer, like Thunderbird, um, over the web browser. Yeah, that's a very interesting topic, another rabbit hole that uh, a lot of people don't really uh, consider, uh, I think, as much as they, they should. Okay, let's just have a kind of a palate cleanser here. I wonder if you each could name something. What is, what is something that, that most people, even privacy seekers, are exposing that they don't appreciate as much as they should appreciate? There are a lot of things that are very inconvenient or uh, just difficult to hide. A lot of people focus a lot on online privacy, but they don't uh, maybe their physical privacy quite as much, like in terms of ordering things online, where, where are you having that shipped to? Are you shipping it directly to your house? Are you sharing your address with different providers, stuff like that? Totally agree. Yeah, that, that's what I always preach. Nick? Well, if, uh, if anything, then I think uh, oversharing is one problem that actually even privacy conscious people often forget about. Humans are, are basically social creatures, and once we get uh, settled in a community, we tend to still to share share little parts and little details about our lives, which, in the grand scheme of things, can actually uh, paint a quite a big picture of a person's life and identity. And I think that's one one of the things that's very hard to change. Everyone can just download a new tool or move to move to a new platform, but changing your inherent human behavior is quite hard how about uh, how about this so a lot of people see self-hosting as the next great frontier for data privacy 
one of the reasons that we have privacy problems is that we have our data on somebody else's servers, somebody else's computer, and then these things get breached or the company itself can view that or give it to law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. If you have your own server in your house to, to store your email or your files or the data on your website, uh, then you obviously have a lot more potential for privacy because there are many fewer third parties involved. Uh, I wonder if you could share with the audience some, maybe some reasonable ways for, let's say a beginner to get getting into more self-hosting. I, I'm a big fan of self-hosting, um, but it's kind of a double-edged sword um, in a sense, because there's a lot of things that you can self-host where it might decrease your privacy because you're running it um, at home or you're the only user of it. So like a lot of people recommend self-hosting um, like the search uh, search engine front end. But if you're the only person searching from that, from that IP, it doesn't really provide a lot of privacy protections for you. But self-hosting is something that we are working on. There is definitely a lot of very valid um, reasons to do it. And that's something that we're working on expanding more on the site. It kind of just comes down to how comfortable you feel with self-hosting. There's a lot of tools that are very useful and in some cases even better than like mainstream alternatives if you self-host them. I'm thinking like Nextcloud, for example, is a great like file management and document collaboration platform um, that is, that's really great to self-host. You don't trust Dropbox? <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> um, yeah, with with all this self-hosting stuff, though, it's... There's a lot of work that needs to be on to make it more accessible. And you can just as easily cut off your arm as, as fend off the enemy. Absolutely. There's there's definitely like a level of skill that's required to to self-host all of this stuff. It's not something that like you can just set up and forget about. It requires maintenance um, or you'll run into outdated software, which will have security vulnerabilities. You could you could end up much worse off if you are using a unmaintained self-hosted service compared to like a cloud service. Right. A lot of uh, people forget uh, that it's not only security that you need to uh need to be aware about, but what about backups? People are already uh, very bad at uh, keeping their password uh, databases backups. Do you think they're going to do it for their email servers? Absolutely. There's a lot of like little stuff like that, that you just have to, <laughs> that you have to think about before you go all in on self-hosting. But if you have all that set up, it, it can be a very good solution. Yeah. So, so Jonah mentioned uh, Nextcloud. Maybe that's something if you're, if you want, if you hear the buzzword self-hosting, you want to start with something, maybe investigate Nextcloud, see how you can store some of the files maybe on, on your own computer in your house, as opposed to relying on, on some third party who is storing all your, your photos and, and files and you're trusting, trusting them with that. So yeah, so just something to uh, kind of chew on, but you guys talk on privacy guides about news aggregators. For people who are not familiar with those, what are news aggregators and how do they help us with privacy? Um, they're basically just RSS readers is the other term that most people would be familiar with. Um, but if you're not, um, RSS is kind of an internet standard. It's it's very old, but it but most websites even today still support it where you can add all of these different news sources, websites that you read, that kind of thing to these news aggregator clients. And then you can read all of all of these news and blog posts that you follow uh, locally on your computer. So in a lot of cases, it lets you avoid um, going to their website directly and avoid like all of the JavaS JavaScript tracking software that uh, news publishers have on their site um, and stuff like that. So it's a really great place to, it's a really great way to follow a lot of different internet sources without having to go to each um, each website that you want to visit individually and and trusting that website. So, so Nick, um, in, in this example, a lot of people, they'd wake up in the morning, they'd check a website, they would go download a podcast. Could you, could you walk us through, how would you use a, an RSS feed, a news aggregator, and what, what does that replace in your life? I actually do use one for myself uh, on my personal Android phone called Feeder. And what I usually use it for is just skimming through different news subjects, which actually prevents me from having to open up my browser, go to the news sites and loading all the trackers, for example, with an RSS feed, I just get an easy way to, to see what, well, articles I will be interested in and are worth it for me to actually open up my browser and go to their site too. 
I think it's a really um, underrated and underused web technology, but pretty much any news publisher you visit supports it. And um, it can even replace like, I know a lot of people use social media like Twitter, for example, um, to get news updates. But if you can do all that in a single place um, directly from the sources instead of through like middlemen on Twitter or whatever, um, it, that's definitely an advantage that these clients have. Agreed. Yes. If you're not familiar with RSS an RSS feed or a news aggregator, then go check privacyguides.org, download one, try it out. Not only will it protect you from various trackers, but it will also funnel all the stuff you want into one place, prevent you from getting distracted and and all that kind of good stuff. Obviously, we understand the importance of backing up our, our data. What is your process, though, for just backing up your computer's data? What, what service do you use? What's kind of your process, Jonah? Um, well, personally, I have a, a NAS at my house. Um, it's a network attached storage device. Um, it's basically like a home server um, with a lot of storage. And I just back up all of my files directly to that. I also back up that NAS to a uh, cloud service. And I uh, just encrypt those backups um, before before sending them to the internet so that they can't be accessed. Um, but that's basically like my my two-step method of backing up all of my stuff. I used to Lux encrypted drives that I keep at home for my uh, for my normal cold storage backups, and I use my Proton drive for my online backups. Personally, yeah, Pro Proton drive is uh, is a great resource, um, great resource from a company that uh, so far we really like in the privacy community. I hope they yeah. never let us down. <laughs> Absolutely. I wish I could use Proton Drive more personally, but I'm still waiting for their desktop clients to come out. <laughs> Hopefully this year. Yeah, it's still rather bare bones, but at least uh, the, the app got open source recently. So, yeah, their mobile apps are pretty nice. Uh, the iOS one I've been using a bit more recently, and I and I'm liking it a lot. If you are listening, definitely become involved in Proton and what it's doing. And so, thank you both for sharing your thoughts on. What is a very valuable resource, privacyguides.org. We'll obviously have a link to that as well as the forum that uh, kind of sustains it and the, the Matrix channel. Are there any other links that you would like me to share or or any other places you would like to direct the, the listener to? Uh, Nick, do you want to start? If there are international listeners to uh, at the show, I would really recommend them to check out our new uh, translations. And if they uh, maybe want to ha help out to add their own language, that would be greatly appreciated. Perfect. There's always something for somebody to do, even if you don't know anything about privacy. If you can translate, uh, if you can do something, then there's there's always a way to help. 